Compañeras y compañeros, uh, hablo español, pero pocas palabras de uh, sindicato se me olvidan, entonces pa, con el tiempo limitado que tenemos voy a hablar en inglés ahora. Um, I, I do speak Spanish, but due to some um, verbiage of uh, union uh, lingo, purposes and time, I'm going to be speaking in English so I can flow a little faster. Um, my name is Fatima. Uh, my name is Fatima Garcia. I am, uh, I have been with LACLA for, um, I've been organizing since 2005, uh, since the, the labor stopped, the strike from May 1st. That was my first um, actual march w that I spoke in. Um, I started as grassroots organizing, and the reason why we're here is to discuss NAFTA and the effects that it has um, in Canada and also in Mexico. Uh, we know that NAFTA is only um, a policy to privatize uh, all natural resources from Canada and Mexico. Uh, they have privatized the oil, um, they have privatized education, the water. Uh, I mean, they, not only do they privatize, but they exploit the land and uh, the workers, uh, the people that work the land. Uh, so, Talking about um, NAFTA and uh, the causes of it, how strong are unions? And I've seen the right to work on there too. So I'm going to kind of be going into um, union organizing and the consequences. Right now, SEIU, USWW, uh, their language of uh, immigration reform has changed a lot through the last 10 years. Um, I'm new with SEIU, USWW, but uh, we have been collaborating as LACLA with many different unions, so I understand the positions of unions. Um, I have a little bit of history of collaborating with unions, not really being a personal, a, a personal staff, but uh, right now what we're seeing is, is how how broken our unions are, uh, both across borders in Mexico and in the United States. Unfortunately, the faith of the membership, the actual rank and file um, with the union is not always um, the best, well, how can I say, the best uh, experience, right? We have seen that um, unions have taken that role of top bottom structure here in the U.S. and also in Mexico. Um, we have seen that, uh, and I'm looking at the members uh, because they're, they're, they're very aware of what's happening, but nonetheless, the unions are the strongest tools that we have to fight against the boss, right, against these corporations. Um, we need people uh, that have the understanding of what a union is and who they're supposed to represent. Uh, sorry, I get really shy with the cameras. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but so so the importance of a union and the right to work right now, we're seeing the right to work, el derecho de, tra de, de, de trabajar, which is attacking um, all unions because now membership is going to have two choices, to either uh, pay dues or not pay dues. And we know that um, unions, they depend on membership dues in order for them to continue to fight back against these corporations and bosses that um, are exploiting across borders, right? And now we have to see this capitalist system, not just as a capitalist system internationally, but it now has became a global capitalist system that is privatizing the U.S. imperialism, is privatizing all of natural resources and everywhere that they have their hands on. Um, we see the, the pushback from uh, Mexico with uh, Pemex, uh, they literally, I mean, and uh, we were at a workshop before and we seen that the uh, people organize themselves under necessity, right, with the earthquake. That was a great example. The earthquakes in Mexico allowed people from, the, the Mexican people to organize because uh, the the resources that they needed weren't coming from the government agencies. They actually went out, they they provided people with food, water, housing, anything, it, uh, medical, there was uh, people from the medical field who were out there supporting uh, the Mexican people. So we see that 
with necessity, the, 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 their own people take lead of uh, taking care of each other, no matter of our differences, right? Um, we are witnessing, we are witnessing a time where um, not only are we in being under uh, being attacked by this global capitalist system, corporations, but we are living in a time in history where uh, human labor is being replaced with automation. So we're seeing uh, that. Pretty soon, within the next 20 years, automation is going to take over some of the public sectors where there's um, there's an there's an expectation of automation taking over uh, attorney jobs, doctor jobs, and why? Because machines you could replace them; they don't take days off, uh, they don't take uh, they don't take uh, vacation. You, you don't have to pay for insurance. Uh, they don't tap into social security, they don't tap into uh, the pensions, and that's exactly what they want to see, right? Is the wor the entire uh, working class to become poor and um, continue to to enrich these corporations but because this government is no longer by the people and for the people. This government is now for the corporations and ran by the corporations. We're seeing um, this happen across borders and the, the importance of this conference and to bring so many people is to say that, you know, that we have to unify our struggles and inter interconnect struggles across borders because right now we're facing an attack globally uh, with all workers, not only by these corporations, but the, they're trying to displace all workers from um, all sectors to uh, by automation. So that's something that we really, but when we speak of automation, we shouldn't fear it. We should also introduce the plan of action to be able to present to to the working class that with automation, we can end the eight work period. We, we have the resources to be able to sustain um, uh, green energy. Uh, we have, so with automation comes a lot of uh, liberation if we use it the right way, but we know that who has the upper hand and the upper hand is by these corporations who own the government now, um, who dictate from the poison food that we eat, that we consume. You know, you have families working more than 40 hours a week that have to decide to buy food or to pay the electricity bill. Right now, rent rising, rent, right, rent raising is um, skyrocketing and it's completely uh, causing an epidemic of homelessness. And we're seeing this throughout the nation. Is that me? We're, we're seeing it throughout the nation happen, and this is, again, privatization of our housing, privatization of our water, of our education, um, of our health care, of our go government. Um, this is taking complete power from the working class because pretty soon what's going to happen if uh, human labor is replaced with automation? Labor has always been the pushback. Labor has always had the power because we've always been able to attack what hurts them, and that's the economics. Um, we've been able to strike with human labor, you know, from May 1st, since the rising of the labor movement in Chicago. Um, we've seen that due to the labor uh, force, the working class, uh, there has been that pushback for us to demand anything that we have that ha that is humane, which is the eight-hour workday, Social Security, a pension here in the United States has been one by the bottom, the bottom up structure. It's because the demands of the workers, the working class, that we've been able to obtain um, all the benefits that we have that they're trying to privatize now. Uh, so it's important to take that in mind that what are we gonna do? What's gonna happen when automation does displace the human labor? Where, where's gonna, what's gonna be the pushback then? Are we preparing um, people for this? Is this something that we're uh, considering or is it far-fetched? I mean, we've seen that right now they're working on cars that drive themselves. Um, that's also, you know, going to displace a lot of the people who uh, do tax. We've seen taxi, uh, the taxis industry has been displaced with Uber and Lyft. That uh, We're seeing that um, 
the different how technology is advancing and so we have to advance with it as well uh, we have to know that um, not to be fearful of when we're having this discussion saying hey everybody's going to lose their jobs because automation is going to come in but also give them that light of hope and saying that with uh, with technology advancing we could really um, we could we can conquer that change that this society desperately needs from our mother earth to uh, our working class the, yeah so thank you thank you thank you All right, now um, I'm going to pass the mic to Susana Prieto Terrazas um, to give us a perspective on the other side of the border. Thank you, Fatima, for highlighting the challenges to labor in the U.S. There we go. She to it. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Susana Prieto Terrazas. Soy abogada de trabajadores en Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, desde hace poquito más de 30 años, no voy a decir la fecha exacta porque sería como decirles mi edad y no quiero descubrirla empezando mi participación. Yo fui invitada a hablar sobre el sindicalismo en México y para mí es muy difícil abordar el tema porque en México no hay sindicatos. En México el único sindicato que hay es el sindicato del gobierno, que es el sindicato de la CTM y de la CROC es la manipulación que tiene el Partido Revolucionario Institucional y también se extendió hacia el ejercicio del gobierno del Partido Acción Nacional los 12 años que estuvo en el poder. En México no tenemos la posibilidad que tienen ustedes de organizarse en uniones con la intención exclusiva de los trabajadores de organizarse, pero tenemos una ley que el señor conoce tan bien como yo que parece o maquilla esto como si efectivamente existiera la libertad sindical en México, porque muchos tratados internacionales de los cuales México es parte ponen como condición que México respete los derechos laborales de sus trabajadores y el derecho sobre todo de unificarse y organizarse en defensa de sus derechos mediante las uniones que ustedes llaman o sindicatos. Pero en la vida diaria nosotros no tenemos sindicatos en México. El gobierno trabaja para que los trabajadores no puedan organizarse en sindicatos para la mejora salarial. Ese es uno de los motivos por los cuales nosotros escuchamos a senadores, a diputados, a luchadores sociales, a trabajadores, a jornaleros y a obreros decir que en México no hay ningún sindicato. ¿Por qué? Porque cuando usted pretende organizarse de manera libre es para beneficio de sus intereses y el primer interés es la mejora de los salarios. Todo mundo cuando habla en, en reuniones como esta a nivel local o a nivel binacional o a nivel internacional siempre está buscando la mejora salarial de los trabajadores. Porque en México no se logra la mejora salarial de los trabajadores porque no permiten que los trabajadores se organicen en uniones que puedan permitirles esto. La regulación legal de la constitución de los sindicatos es sumamente sencilla. Creo que es un capítulo de la Ley Federal del Trabajo que no alcanza a ser un capítulo total. Dice que tanto los patrones como los trabajadores tienen derecho a organizarse y a unirse y a constituirse en sindicatos para la defensa de sus derechos ¿sí? comunes. Los patrones están muy bien organizados, por lo menos en Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, que es de lo que les puedo hablar. Anteriormente tenían una organización que se llama AMAC, por sus siglas es Asociación de Maquiladora Asociación Civil, y esta se dividió en dos. Index, que ahora es industria de exportación, que ahorita algún compañero hablaba de los porcentajes exagerados de lo que exportamos los mexicanos, pues no exportamos más que lo de ustedes los gringos, porque es lo que exportamos, no exportamos ningún producto de nosotros. ¿no? Y, y, y estos sindicatos de Index eh, es un sindicato patronal y hay otro que se separa de la MAC. ¿Y por qué se, se separa? Porque dice, yo soy mejor patrón que tú. Y como ustedes son muy desgraciados y traen una política de exprimir al trabajador hasta lo máximo, yo me separo y entonces me constituye en un, diverso, en un diverso sindicato o una diversa asociación de patrones que voy a denominar Southwest Maquila. Y ahora tenemos dos en Ciudad Juárez, Index y Southwest Maquila. Pero no tenemos sindicatos. Los sindicatos de la CTM y de la CROC no se les permite el ingreso. Lo único que están haciendo ahorita es trabajando con los contratos colectivos de protección patronal. Es decir, 
ese es la, el bloque que nosotros tenemos en nuestra lucha sindical, si los trabajadores de una maquila se organizan para formar un sindicato independiente de los sindicatos de Estado, entonces la maquila sale y nos dice, no, no puedes, porque yo ya tengo celebrado un contrato colectivo de trabajo con la CTM o con la CROC. Y... Eh, perdón, es que tenemos un problema con la traducción, a ver si ya lo han arreglado. Desde que yo se está perdón. If the machine isn't working, maybe you guys want to be a small group. Next one. Got it. Mejor dónde nos quedamos? Ya, yeah, okay. ¿Continuamos ya? ¿Ahora? Yeah. Sí, bueno. Entonces, es prácticamente imposible que los trabajadores se organicen en defensa de sus derechos. ¿Por qué? Porque el gobierno tiene este esquema de sindicatos de gobierno o gubernamentales que siempre impiden una defensa real de los trabajadores o una organización de los trabajadores para lograr mejoras de las condiciones de trabajo. ¿Y por qué es tan importante que nosotros nos constituyamos en sindicatos para la mejora de nuestro salario y nuestras prestaciones laborales? Pues es muy fácil. Ustedes saben que la Constitución Política de los Estados Unidos Mexicanos, igual que la de ustedes, prevé la forma en la que los trabajadores pueden unirse para lograr estas mejoras de las condiciones laborales y en la huelga. En México, desde la última reforma que hicieron a la Ley Federal del Trabajo, dijeron la única forma en que los trabajadores pueden emplazar a huelga a un patrón es mediante un sindicato. Entonces, por eso no dejan que haya sindicatos, porque si no hay sindicato, no puede haber emplazamientos a huelga y si no hay emplazamientos a huelga, no hay mejora salarial, no hay mejora de las condiciones generales de trabajo, aunque a nivel internacional, de acuerdo a esta redacción de la ley, ellos cumplen con la norma internacional de la supuesta libre sindicalización en México, que no es sino letra muerta como muchas de las leyes que nosotros tenemos desafortunadamente en nuestro país. Esto impide que los trabajadores se organicen en contra de la industria maquiladora para que pague salarios dignos al trabajo que están realizando. Y es muy importante que en un foro como este ustedes sepan que en Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, que es una ciudad maquiladora, hace mucho tiempo que debieron cambiarle el término por ciudad manufacturera porque hace años que dejamos de ser maquiladora. Nosotros ya producimos productos completos. Un operador puede hacer un arnés completo que anteriormente se hacía en 10 o 12 rotaris o secciones para poder lograr un arnés, ahora lo hace un trabajador. En ese país en el que el gobierno no quiere que sus trabajadores progresen, no nos han dejado ser industria manufacturera. Ellos alegan que los salarios bajos que nosotros percibimos es por la falta de preparación preparación académica de los trabajadores. Si no hay certificación de los trabajadores, no puede haber mejores salarios. Pero eso es también completamente falso, porque hay un, un plan estratégico de Juárez, que es un organismo no gubernamental que trabaja, uh, sobre todo con jóvenes en Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, es una estadística de los 33 municipios en México que tienen industria transnacional, entre ellos Juárez y Tijuana. Son 33 municipios nada más, pero los 33 municipios tienen salarios completamente dispares. Nos hemos dado cuenta que la industria maquiladora establecida en Querétaro, en Guanajuato, en Jalisco, en estos estados del centro, que son el desarrollo planeado por Enrique Peña Nieto, perciben salarios entre 285 y 300 pesos diarios los obreros, en contraposición a los 120 o máximo 150 pesos que les pagan en Tijuana, o en Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, cuando el costo de producción y traslado de sus productos en la franja fronteriza entre Tijuana y Juárez es mucho más barato que trasladar sus mercancías desde el centro de México, que es un país bastante grande. Entonces, es evidente que no hay una igualdad en México y si no nos permiten constituirnos en sindicato, es muy difícil para los trabajadores lograr mejoras en sus condiciones generales de trabajo. Nosotros estamos proponiendo que se 
unifiquen los salarios de la industria maquiladora en las 33 ciudades en las que se encuentran establecidas las empresas transnacionales para que los trabajadores tengan igualdad ahí porque esto es un principio constitucional, el compañero que sabe más de la constitución lo sabe, a igual trabajo, igual salario y los trabajadores de Querétaro y de Silao realizan el mismo trabajo que los trabajadores de Ciudad Juárez y Tijuana y perciben menos salarios. Este es un pacto que existe entre los gobiernos de Estados Unidos y de México, que Tijuana y que Juárez no progresen. ¿Por qué? Porque evidentemente si los trabajadores de Tijuana y, Me de Tijuana y Ciudad Juárez que están ubicados en la franja fronteriza prosperan, muy seguramente abandonarán el trabajo de la industria. Los estados no han desarrollado ni Baja California Norte ni Chihuahua, han desarrollado oh, opciones alternas a la industria maquiladora. Prácticamente, ahorita platicaba con los compañeros de Tijuana, en Tijuana hay 200 y tantos de trabajadores laborando en la industria maquiladora, mientras que en Ciudad Juárez tenemos el mayor número con 329 mil trabajadores dentro de la industria maquiladora. En la industria maquiladora que fundamentalmente se desarrolla para la industria automotriz, que es la, la de mayor producción en Estados Unidos. Entonces, es muy importante que ustedes sepan que la, la organización sindical no existe fuera del control del Estado en México. Y eso es muy grave, porque si ustedes se quejan de la violación a sus derechos como trabajadores en Estados Unidos, imagínense cómo estamos en México, que no tenemos ninguna opción. En México se han organizado muy bien gobierno y empresas porque los políticos que son el gobierno son los sirvientes de los empresarios, los dueños del dinero. Y los dueños del dinero son las empresas transnacionales fundamentalmente o la industria nacional. Por ello, no han dejado que los trabajadores progresen y tengan salarios dignos. La industria maquiladora en Ciudad Juárez y en Tijuana no es lo que le platican a ustedes. Ellos han generado cadenas de miseria increíbles alrededor de estas zonas urbanas por los salarios raquíticos que perciben. No es cierto que el gobierno nos da casas, no es cierto que el gobierno prevé lo mejor, provee lo mejor para sus trabajadores en México. Estamos en condiciones iguales o peores en algunas zonas que los jornaleros de San Quintín y laboramos para las empresas del primer mundo de Estados Unidos. Es importante que nosotros nos unifiquemos en las luchas y que por, por, podamos hablar de ustedes. A mí me llamó mucho la atención en el foro anterior un compañero que hablaba y decía aquí está compañero de la camisa morada bueno si nos vamos a apoyar hay que apoyarnos sino no más estar con mamadas bueno a mí me pareció muy bien su terminología porque es cierto a veces uno pide ayuda y se da cuenta que los sindicatos no tienen establecida realmente una lucha ni tampoco van a ser solidarios con los otros sino que al igual que los partidos políticos se constituyen con esos fines con fines políticos y no tienen ningún interés en ayudar a la clase trabajadora ojalá y esta reunión sirva para que realmente haya una hermandad a nivel binacional Estados Unidos y México para que luego no puedan seguir pisoteando los derechos de los trabajadores ni de un país ni de otro. Creo que terminó mi intervención. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, Steve Zeltzer to take the mic, um, take us back across the border to the United States again. Yeah. Um, welcome, all of you, and I think we had a, a very important act of solidarity earlier uh, today with the San Quentin workers, uh, which is an example, an expression of direct solidarity between workers in the United States and workers in Mexico. So uh, we are here today to fight to call, cancel NAFTA, and uh, what has been the effect of NAFTA Uh, on the U.S. working class. It's been disastrous. Uh, we have Brother Scott Holderson here from the UAW and Ford, but many workers in the United States have been told that if they don't lower their wages, the factories will move to Mexico. So they use NAFTA as like a hammering rod to tell workers to give up their wages and conditions. And the Rust Bowl uh, really is part of NAFTA. Uh, the destruction of uh, industrial workforce by the United States capitalists to go to Mexico, then to go to the, first to the South, then to go to Mexico, and then to Asia. The capitalists are to blame for this crisis, not immigrant workers, not Mexicans, not, Latin, not, not the immigrant workers. But Trump and the capitalists blame immigrant workers, for which is an economic problem. 
which is the capitalists go where they make the greatest profit. And we have to say also, uh, in regard to San Quentin, that it's U.S. companies that are exploiting the workers in Mexico. Uh, the auto parts plants in Mexico uh, are run by U.S. companies. And these U.S. companies use the Mexican government to repress workers in Mexico and in the United States. So what are the problems in the United States? I'm involved now in a, in a struggle of striking workers, Henkel Aeronautics uh, in, in Bay Point. Henkel is a German multinational. And um, in Europe, they're organized. But uh, these workers, uh, Latino and African American, uh, had no health and safety protection. One worker was pulled into a machine, and he was killed. As a result of that and other injuries on the job, these workers decided to join a union to protect their lives, the IAM. So they joined a union and got a contract, and they were negotiating for their second contract, and the company, Henkel, pushed them out on strike. Uh, on strike. So the company also has brought in SCAB, a professional strike-breaking company called Strom Engineering. The same company, Strom Engineering, was involved in bringing 7,500 SCAB mechanics to Northwest Airlines to break the Northwest Airline mechanics. So this is a, a national company that's organizing to break strikes of workers. Now, I, I videotaped and interviewed the workers, and we got the video out internationally. But one of the things that we have to do to defend these workers is we have to say this is a struggle for all workers. Workers who are on strike have to be supported by all workers, regardless of the union. And this is a problem in the United States. This is a big problem. Because, for example, in the UAW, and maybe Scott can refer to it, there have been strikes and lockouts, like the Honeywell workers, UAW, that were on strike or they were locked out and nobody knew about it. It wasn't on the website of the UAW. It wasn't on the website of the AFL-CIO. So we have to build a communication network, and that's why we formed this group called Worker Solidarity Action Network, to link up all workers, regardless of unions, that if one worker is fired because of union organizing, that we all unite. If workers are on strike or locked out, we all organize, and we build a movement. This is what we have to build, a workers' movement of the entire working class that one of the obstacles to that is business unionism. Business unionism is the ideology that I just am um, concerned with the workers of my own union. Bread and butter issues. I don't want to get involved in other union struggles. That is killing our unions. That is killing our unions. We cannot have a, an ideology that says all I'm interested in are dues-paying members. If you're not a dues-paying member, you're on your own. So we are organizing on, on the Henkel strike to have an action because there's another factory in Berkeley, a cosmetics factory, organized by Teamsters by the same company, Henkel. And this company brought the supervisors of that company and brought them to Bay Point to be used as scab supervisors and workers in the struck plant. So we're going to have an action in two weeks in Berkeley of all workers to, to protest this Henkel company. These companies are multinationals. These companies are all over the world. What we have to do is link up all our struggles. So when, when workers are on strike against one company, multinational, that has links, other factories that we link up together. This is the way we will organize in Mexico, in the Maquiladoras. We will link up directly with the parts plant workers in the United States and the auto plants and other companies and say, you are not going to bust the workers in Mexico because it will hurt us. Because when wages are low in Mexico and they have no unions, it hurts American workers. That's a direct relationship. So we have to build this uh, information network and solidarity network and fight against business unionism. We have to demand that our unions and labor councils have lists of all their strikes of, that are going on, strikes and lockouts. And as I said, if you go to the AFL-CIO website today, you can't find any strikes and lockouts in the United States. Why is that? We have to use our websites, our union websites, to uh, tell, the story, tell the story. The other thing that we have to train ourselves in, we have to become journalists. What does that mean? It's hard for them to hear oh, over there. Okay, we have, to ha we have to become journalists. We have to go to strikes and workers who are st on strike or locked out, and we have to interview them and put them on Facebook. We have to get their stories out. We have to break the information blockade. Health and safety is a very serious issue in the United States. One of the campaigns we're involved in is FedEx workers. President Trump has nominated a man named Scott Mugno, Scott Mugno as head of OSHA, chief of OSHA. Scott Mugno is vice president for FedEx. He has organized to prevent workers from getting health and safety. 
work, 169 workers have died in the last three years at FedEx because of bad health and safety problems at this company. So we have to organize and educate workers to fight for health and safety, to organize for health and safety, and also we, I were proposing, and I have some motions, to demand that Scott Henkel not be appoint, uh, nominated as uh, chief of OSHA. The, one political problem, another political problem, the unions are completely silent on the nomination of Scott Mugno. His first hearing comes up this Wednesday. Why is it that no national union in the United States is opposed to this nomination of, of Scott Mugno. This is a problem of communication, a problem of fighting Trump. And the last point I want to make is about NAFTA. Now Trump, as we all know, said that he was going to uh, first uh, abolish NAFTA, now he says he wants to make it better. That's what Trump said. Now, do we believe that Trump is going to make NAFTA better for us? How many of you believe that? <laughs> I'll sell you a bridge if you believe that Trump is gonna make NAFTA better. Yet our unions refuse to say cancel NAFTA. We could win over workers who voted for NAFTA by saying we don't believe in NAFTA. We believe in direct solidarity with our brothers and sisters. We're for canceling NAFTA. But the unions, national unions, unfortunately, have said we want to reform NAFTA. And I think that, is a, that plays into Trump's hand. I don't want him to touch anything that has to do with working people. Because his goal is to destroy us to destroy all unions. So we have a motion to oppose the nomination of Scott Mugno as chief of OSHA at this conference and call on all unions to oppose the nomination. And I think that we have not had a working class movement in the United States since the 1930s and 40s. There was a witch hunt. Communist militants were kicked out of the leadership of the unions and what you have is a corporate union structure. We have to change that because that structure will not defend us. That's what we see now. So we say organize, build a network, get our stories out, and build direct solidarity between worker and worker. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much, Steve. So before um, I open it up for discussion, I'm gonna talk a little bit about right to work and what we're doing in Los Angeles around fighting right to work. Um, before I get into that though, I think we in the labor movement, I've been in the labor movement for over 15 years, like the compañera, I'm not gonna give specific dates. Um, but I, I think we are, we're not doing a good job of talking about what right to work is, right? We're at a crossroads in the labor movement today um, where we're facing, I think, the virtual elimination of the labor movement in the US if we don't start organizing on a larger scale and if we don't effectively fight back against the attacks from the right wing and corporate forces um, that would like to end the labor movement. So, I, you know, let's just t to take a step back, who here can explain or, or give what they understand the phrase right to work to mean? Anybody? The brother? Sure, right to work is, is a uh, scheme by uh, the government and the corporations uh, to drain unions of their funds. That, that's all it's, all it's about. It's to drain unions of their funds and their political power. Um, it allows people to opt out of... Uh, I'm sorry. Should I repeat that? Okay. Uh, right to work is, is a scheme by the corporations and by the uh, uh, government to drain unions of their funds and to drain unions of their political power. Uh, by allowing uh, workers to opt out of paying union dues, it uh, depletes the funds of the unions and weakens them, uh, not only in their uh, ability to fight politically, but in their ability to fight the corporations that, that the workers are uh, relying on them to, to defend. That's, that's my Thank view you. of right Thank to work. Thank you. That was a great explanation. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take a step back. Ralph, did you want to add to that? <laughs> Briefly. I think it's important to point out that the, the right to work formula 
is a dishonest attempt on the part of employers and the ruling class to equate unionism with restricting workers' rights as opposed to defending them. It's, in, it's the opposite of the truth, of course. It's a, a form of union busting to equate membership with a union and the payment of dues to, uh, to the union to defend workers' rights and, and to fight for, uh, for the working class, to turn that into its opposite. It's a complete patent dishonest nonsense which represents the opposite of the truth as is normally the case with capitalist propaganda. It should be labeled and exposed as exactly that. Thank you. Yes, that's absolutely right. We call it right to work because that's what the right has called it, right? But many of us call it also right to shirk, right? Right to work for less. Um, and and it's important, I think, that we all, when, when we talk in labor about the, these attacks that we understand and explain to people where they came from, right? 1947, we had the Taft-Hartley Act passed. And, and what was Taft-Hartley intended to do? It was to curb labor's growing power, right? The rise in power of labor, waves of strikes. Taft-Hartley was intended to curb that. And what it did was it ended closed shop. It ended the ability to require that you be a union member in order to work somewhere, right? So, so Taft-Hartley ended closed shop. But even the Republican-controlled Congress at the time recognized that uh, with the changes in the law, they were requiring unions to represent workers uh, completely and fully as if they were union members uh, without workers being required to pay any kind of uh, a share of that cost of representation. So what they did was they said, okay, we're going to include in the law something that allows unions to get a fee for at least the collective bargaining service that they're providing, right? Not the cost of new organizing, not the cost of the political work they're doing, but just the cost of that share of collective bargaining. So this was Taft-Hartley in 1947. Mark? There's a, just quickly, there's an interesting parallel between a union and the country of the United States. When you, a union is there to, to protect you on the job and defend you, and the government of the United States is ostensibly here to defend us and help us in our daily lives. So if we don't have to pay dues to be protected by the union, we shouldn't have to pay taxes to be protected by the state. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I want to acknowledge we have uh, a tremendous wealth of experience in the labor movement in the room, so I look forward to opening this up as a discussion. Just to continue the conversation. Okay. All right, excellent. We got a, we've got an extension. We've got a, a longer period for the yeah. workshop. The brother here? I just wanted to, uh, not to contradict any of the things that you've said, but just as a correction, on one point particular, that there hasn't been a workers' movement, uh, working class movement in this country since 1930s. I don't agree with you. There's the civil rights movement was a working class movement that unfortunately the working class, white working class, was opposed to, which in the end ended up elevating everybody standards of living. So I, you know, that's my only correction. Other than that, I agree with you on everything else. Okay. One more comment over here and then I'm just going to I'm going to finish the presentation and then we'll get into the discussion fully. How much time do I have? <laughs> right now I'm gonna, I'm just going to finish the presentation. So if you had a direct comment on what the brother said here. Uh, no, not on that. Okay. Just okay. Uh, so, so just briefly, and then we'll jump into the discussion. Um, I think we, we know what right to work is about, right? That, that Taft-Hartley law put a loophole in, in there that allowed states to do away even with that fair share requirement, right? And so that's what we've seen in terms of legislative attacks from anti-union forces, from corporate forces, is 28 states now, right? Anybody correct me if there's been more since the last time I checked, 28 states now that are right to work, which means a union has a right has the obligation to represent everybody in a bargaining unit, even if 
members of that bargaining unit pay nothing, right? And so strong is that legal obligation that someone can sue the union for not defending them in uh, termination hearing, for example, even though they are not a union member, even though they don't pay. And so the whole point of this, obviously, is to try and bankrupt and eliminate unions and basically turn the landscape of the U.S. in terms of the ability to advocate for higher wages, to put any kind of impediments to corporate power in the same situation that we see across the border in Mexico, right? Um, to do away with the you know union's finger in the dam of um, the corporate push to eliminate all protections for workers, um, whether it be health and safety or wage and hour, et cetera. Um, and who's behind this, right? And anybody just throw out a name? Who who's funding this? Alec. Alec, right? Koch brothers. Who else? <laughs> The Waltons, yes, these are familiar names, right? So Alec, we saw, has an agenda uh, that includes mass incarceration of people of color. Uh, we, uh, we've seen also um, from their uh, wheelhouse of ideas, SB 1070, anti-immigrant legislation in uh, Arizona, which feeds into the detention system, the privatized prison system and detention system. So we know what the agenda is behind the forces that are trying to destroy labor in the U.S., and they're not just going after us. Um, and we know what the consequences are. Uh, we know also that right now we're seeing not just these legislative attacks to turn states' right to work, we're also seeing court cases, right? Huge funding from the Freedom Foundation and the Heritage Foundation for cases in our court system, like Janus versus AFSCME. The case being heard right now before the Supreme Court that by this June will decide whether that fair share fee that goes to unions for all workers they represent is eliminated entirely. Uh, I think there's virtually no expectation that this Supreme Court will decide in favor of the labor movement on this one. We expect that fair share fees will be eliminated by June, which means, uh, you know, huge losses to the public sector unions uh, across the country. You know, and I will say in Los Angeles, uh, you know, we have, um, we have a lot of work to do amongst our public sector unions, and we're by no means in the worst shape in this country. Um, but, but there's uh, fee payers in you know, nearly all of our public sector unions. And so the devastation that this is going to wreak on the labor movement goes not just to the public sector, right? not just to the good um, public sector jobs that have been traditionally the backbone of the African American working class here, for example. This is going to have ripple effects into the private sector union uh, unionization rates, which are already incredibly low. And so, uh, you know, the right wing has a, has a threefold strategy. They have court cases. They have lawsuits, right? They have uh, they have legislation in you know working across all 50 states, and they've got organizing now. The Freedom Foundation in Washington and Oregon, and now just recently in Orange County here in California, they're knocking on doors. They're hiring organizers on the right wing to knock on doors and tell union members to give themselves a raise. Stop paying your union dues, uh, become a fee payer, and give yourself a raise. Um, and so th this is a three-pronged strategy from the right. We don't have the luxury of relying on uh, litigation because we know eventually it goes to the Supreme Court, which is stacked by the Trump administration now. Right? We can try for legislation, but much of it is preempted because these are federal laws. Um, so what do we have? We have organizing, right? <laughs> we have organizing, and luckily, that's what we do well, right, when, when we're at our best in the labor movement. Um, so I, I will say the approach that um, we've been trying and just starting here in Los Angeles is to take on multi-union campaigns, to bring janitors together with teachers, to bring construction workers together with the steel workers, with child care workers, um, across the board, private and public sector union members coming together, getting trained on how to have organizing conversations with fellow workers in other industries, and really building a solidarity effort. And trying to use what we do well in 
labor, which is you know often pouring money collectively into electoral fights, switching that over to organizing. How do we do that in an organizing forum? And how do we do it educating around gender and race and the connections between us? Um, and really developing a solidarity and class consciousness. So we're doing multi-union organizing drives. We had our first one in September. We have our next one coming up at UCLA um, in February. And um, you know, I think there's similar movements across the country to use this moment of crisis as a time to reinvigorate our unions and to say if we don't take on these issues of race and class and cross-border solidarity, we won't be around any longer, right? So, so we need to really train and empower union members to do the work and take over and have ownership of their unions um, and, and build a movement again. So I'm gonna end with that and then open it up for discussion. Thank you. We got uh, over here. Thank you. Uh, I was earlier in the in the workshop on the privatization of public education, and I have to mention the enormous similarities that we have in, in the struggle that we are facing. And you talked about the unification of all workers and all working class, and academic or intellectual workers. We are also part of the working class, and we are facing the same enemy and the same struggle. Capital also is seeking to control the labor process of teachers. And they're also doing it by using technology to fragment us and to de-skill our profession. So we're also facing the destruction of our profession as teachers. And we're also going to be terribly affected by the right to work laws. Okay? And we're also like the compañera from Mexico, we're also facing a, a, a union, a state union, that unfortunately has sided with the privatizers. So we're facing a, a, a hard struggle at the state, local, and district level. So I think that all workers should work together, academic, intellectual, manual workers. We have one struggle, one enemy, and one victory for all. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Ernesto, and uh, I came to get educated. I mean, this is the first time I hear about NAFTAC. What I know about it is that when it was built in uh, 1993, um, they put some clause that you can't cancel it, you can remodel it or rebuild it. My question was for the gentleman over there. So am I right or am I wrong? It can be canceled, but it can be remodeled. I mean, our president wants to, I think he stands on trying to cancel it, but uh, it becomes like a door for a bunch of lawsuits and that our legislation is going to fight against it. Um, what can you so talk about? I'll, I'll give that to Steve to answer and then we have the okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you repeat the question? The, the, is, it possible to is, it, is it possible to cancel NAFTA? Yes, it is possible for the United States to say we no longer want to be part of NAFTA. But the, you know, the, the organizations that are for continuing NAFTA are, guess what? The auto parts companies, the auto companies, the electrical companies, the businesses that make money from NAFTA. Uh, if we have demonstrations, and this is what our union should be doing all over the country to cancel NAFTA, that would have a tremendously powerful effect because it would say that NAFTA should be canceled. The question that people have is what is going to replace it if NAFTA is canceled? Well, they'll continue to trade and they'll continue to, uh, to trade. But, but what, what will happen, and this is one of the things I want to discuss later, is that under NAFTA, they have changed the Constitution of Mexico to allow the privatization of the land, to allow the privatization of telecom, to allow the privatization of all the natural resources. So my view, and I, we have a resolution, is if NAFTA is canceled, and it should be canceled, that all that property and land should go back to the Mexican people. And the workers and people of Mexico should have that. It's basically, it, they've been expropriated, and now they want to turn it over to U.S. corporations to directly take it over. That's another reason for the cancellation of NAFTA. But no one as yet is raising this question, what happens if NAFTA is canceled? Which is a good question. And how should it be canceled? Mm -hmm. It would mean that, that those agreements, like the land, privatization land, would, be, would change. And we'd say the land should be uh, public again for the, for the peasants. But it can be canceled. Okay, uh, we've got two over here, and then I'll work my way around for the next. Oh, no. 
going to wait for that. Okay. I'm going to go a little bit in English and the rest in Spanish. Uh, one thing we have to have very clear. NAFTA is not the cause of the, the suspension of the land reform in Mexico. NAFTA was a consequence of the economic disaster of Mexico. See? NAFTA came afterwards all our disasters. After they stopped the uh, land, for, uh, land reform, after they sold the banks, after they sold the industry, after they sold all the goods that we had. That's why Mexico asked for NAFTA. So NAFTA is the consequence of a disaster. It's not what had brought the disaster. The only thing that had happened under NAFTA is that we live under the same miserable conditions. When NAFTA came into place, we had 25 million people in poverty. Now we have 60 million people in poverty because the salaries in Mexico are determined by a commission integrated by the syndicates, by the government, and by the bosses by the corporations. It's not determined by Congress. That's why we have no salaries. Right now, until the 30th, until the 30th of November, the wage was 80 pesos per day. It went up to 85 pesos on the 1st of December, and it will go up to 88 pesos on the 1st of January. That's only $5 a day. Here in the United States, if we're gonna to work together like you guys suggest, See, we have to take into consideration that we've been under NAFTA for 23 years and the American unions, the American, the labor, your organized labor in the United States has never spoken for us. Now that uh, Trump has uh, intended to walk away, he can. All he's got to do is just give the other two nations six months advisory. See, because in the United States it's, a, it's an agreement, it's not a treaty. In Mexico and Canada, it's a treaty. That's a difference. Now, going to the syndicates itself, for example, in Wisconsin was a very dramatic case for the right of, of work, of labor, how you call it, right of work. For us in Mexico, the right of work, we've been fighting for the right, of, the right to work. We have legislation for the worker, but we don't have any work. So there is a cultural difference that we have to understand. Now, as uh, the attorney lady said, in Mexico, we don't have actual syndicates, but we have a lot of white syndicates. We have the largest syndicate in Latin America, the teachers' union, is 1,300,000. We have the strongest economic syndicate in Latin America, Sindicato de Petroleros. We have the most corrupt syndicate and largest in mining, Sindicato Nacional de Mineros. They are all white syndicates. They are state syndicates. We don't have people syndicates. So in our project, constitutional project that we are sponsoring, we are talking about the obligation of Congress to determine the minimum wage. How? As the Constitution establishes a, a fair wage that includes food, dress, housing, schooling, and uh, vacations. Do you think that with 88 pesos uh, a day, a person can? So if we're going to work together, if the uh, organized labor in the United States is going to uh, identify and work with us, we have a long way to go, gentlemen. You guys, for example, uh, I understand in the auto industry, your lowest wage is $10 or 12 an hour? Depends on what part of the auto industry it is. But it's, it's, it's a high wage, you know? So you can't compare $100, and, and, uh, what, $100 a day to $5 a day. It will be very difficult to work together unless we eliminate that cultural difference between the two concepts. We are fighting for the right to work because we don't have any work. That's why we have 7 million people illegally or undocumented on this side of the border. When NAFTA was signed, there were a lot of us that were, went against it because it had two big different, uh, defin defi deficiencies. One, it did not consider the conditions of labor. It did not provide for a decent wage and a decent conditions of work for labor. And the second was it ignored completely the immigration problem, which it is not an immigration problem, it's a human problem. And that's the, that's the deficiency in, in NAFTA. That's why, as Mexicans, we want it canceled. 
or we're treated with dignity and decency, or we don't want any part of it. So NAFTA is the consequence of many years, 70 years, under one party rule, that dis destroyed the economy, destroyed the society, eliminated every revolution standard that, that those people fought for. Entonces, yo no pretendo desmentir a la compañera, tiene toda la razón, pero sí hay sindicatos, pero son blancos, que no sirven para nada, los sindicatos. Sí, los sindicatos. Sí. I was talking about ah, the okay. Sí, sí, los privados no existen. But we have those public syndicates that are, are worth nothing. So, okay. so, gentlemen, let's work together. But we have a long way to go. And we need your determination. And we need that to eliminate and, or, or overcome that cultural difference that we have about concepts, about income, about decency, about, about dignity. See, we need to overcome all that. Thank you. Thank you. So I've got uh, Carlos, Ralph, Al, and then I'll come right around this way. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Um, I think we got to look at a reality here, here in the United States. We're at 10 points, I think 2016, it was 10.7% union density in the United States. 10.7. We got no bragging rights here as organized labor at all. When the brother Baltasar talked about organizing the organized, that should have been the battle cry since May 1st, back then during the Haymarket riot. We broke international worker solidarity by creating the AFL-CIO and breaking away from the international labor movement and doing our own agenda, moving our Labor Day from May Day to September. And it's been a dine, downhill spiral since then. Now take that 10.7%. How many of those people are in public sector unions? The majority. Can't even count on one hand how many of that percentage points are private sector workers. What are we talking about here? We're sitting on our ass doing nothing. We're not holding our, organize our laborers accountable for this disaster. All they're doing is retiring out. All they're doing is timing themselves out so they can retire with their pensions and the hell with the rest of us. Back when we had the Greyhound strike and the Douglas strike here, back in the, what, the, what, the uh, 70s, that was where it started. Two-tier wage systems, and it started going all the way down. UPS did it with their time clocks out there. And we watch it going down. We haven't had a serious strike in, in LA for how long? Seriously. We had to combine a Greyhound and a, and a Douglas strike to actually have some semblance of, 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 of face saving. And it failed miserably. They broke the grocer's strike to the point where the grocers went bankrupt in the, in the 90s and had to pull out of the FLC because they couldn't pay their per capita. Broke that union because the public didn't support those workers. They tested us and tested and they tested us with a final death blow with Wisconsin. They called the bluff on organized labor, say, okay, let's see what you can do. We're going to your headquarters of AFSCME. We're going to the headquarters of where almost the unions are. And they beat us, because we sat on our asses. We pay our dues and only complain when we don't get the right union contract. We're there for the Christmas party, or for the giveaway, but we don't hold our leadership accountable. We don't demand transparency. What do we expect, what role model are we? Back in the day when there was the Haymarket Riot during that period of time, the American labor movement was the role model for organized labor. We're an embarrassment. We haven't had a higher labor density of 30% since the 1950s. 30%! Other countries have higher densities than we do. Where are the constituent groups? I'm with LACLA. There's six of them with the AFL-CIO. How come our labor councils don't have all six constituent groups active in their CLCs? Because it shows, it indicts them, they don't give a shit about their workers. They don't want to hear their voices. That's why the, the two African American uh, constituent groups are not there. Maybe one's there. Lachla's not there. Apollo's not there. The woman's here. So I think is we, need, we need to do is have some serious dialogue here. Holding our CLCs accountable. 
We need a serious binational labor encounter where we meet with the workers in Mexico. If they can't come here, fine. We'll meet in Tijuana. Tijuana is where, the, where the, all three markets enter. Asian, South America, North America. They come together in the San Diego-Tijuana region. Strategically, we should be looking at finding a way to create cross-border solidarity so we don't see eating Hershey candy that's made in Mexico now. All our consumer goods are made in Mexico now, and we're not even publicizing it. The brother made a good point. There used to be a do not patronize list in our union newspapers from the CLCs. They're not there anymore. They're not there anymore. We don't know where we're buying. Oh, we go to Costco, it's union. No, they're not. 90% of those Costco's are not union. You know, we have to start doing some consumer education. If the, if the great boycott was broken, I mean, the great, great boycott succeeded by breaking the growers with, with dollars, we see Drisk, the Driscoll's boycott as an opportunity for organized labor, for the workers, to take this to another level. We have to learn from what was gained 30, 40 years ago and go forward. Because Driscoll isn't the only company. It isn't the only company. And it's not fair that our brothers and sisters in Mexico are making those miserable wages. And we can go to Walmart and buy things cheap or go to the 99 cent store. That, it's, we don't live that way. It's time to stop. Stop this right now. Draw the line in the sand. Let's build, let's build for uh, a binational labor encounter where like groups of workers break out into a session by themselves and get to know each other and create those strategies of cross-border solidarity. If we do it right, we become again the role model for the rest of the workers globally. If we can do it with our neighbor to the south, I'm quite sure we'd have no problem with the Canadian workers. When they warned Mexico, do not sign that agreement, they got screwed in that agreement when they did it with the United States. So I mean, that's it. So I'm proposing that we look at that. I thought that's actually what we were doing. So thank you. Thank you. All right. We got Ralph over here, and then we'll move around the circle. Uh, brothers and sisters, this is a very large discussion. Let me make some very brief comments. When the unions decided with the AFL-CIO to, to accept that they were going to change the Labor Day from uh, May 1st to September, when they support Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, New Deal to save capitalism, you're, re you're re looking at the role of the Communist Party in channeling the left into support for capitalism and for the restoration and preservation thereof. This has to do with the question of Stalinism and the fate of the Russian Revolution. You cannot isolate the class struggle from its international content and from the role of the revolutionary movement at, lar at large with respect to what happens within the United States, a key center of it, a key arena in which it unfolds. In the, in the, in the second a term of Franklin Roosevelt, the rate of unemployment in 1937-1938 matched that of 1929. What did they do? They put people back to work by putting them in, 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 in employment in the arms industry. Production for arms replaced what was for formerly a form of subsidizing public activity. This is a function of capitalism and imperialism in, in, in a period of total decay. Uh, with respect to some of the, the questions pertaining to the Macladores and the Ejidos, there are no Macladores without the destruction of the Ejidos in Mexico. The rollback of the Mexican Revolution is a function of an all-out assault on the gains of the Mexican Revolution. That's what enables the international ruling class to create the conditions for starvation Ejidos in, in, um, uh, in, in excuse me, starvation Macladores with the elimination of the right of the the Mexican peasantry to the, to the land, the ownership of the land. These are un, uh, um, uh, inseparable un, uh, undertakings that reflect the nature of the class struggle which we have to be focused upon. Understand it, see it in its context, to apply the lessons to today. They're more relevant today than they've ever been before. One last point with respect to these people who come to knock on workers' doors to tell them, buy, earn yourself a little more by 
uh, using a union dues to pay yourself more money. Those people are paid by cock, coke, and, and the union destroyers. That's a case of fraud. They're not just independent individuals knocking on a door like Jehovah's Witnesses. There should be a, a militant union leadership would immediately attack these people with not just with the law, but with mobilizing workers to defend their, to defend their people against this sort of uh, assault by a corrupt uh, ruling class. All these questions that we're discussing, brothers and sisters, have to do with how we understand the nature of our struggle, what our tasks are, who we have to fight with, and who we have to fight against. We can't duck that question much longer. Thank you. So I have Brother Al Rojas and then Brother Valdemar Velasquez. Here you go. Um. <clears throat> brothers and sisters, uh, in listening to all of you, there isn't one of you that has injected some ingredient to the whole issue of why we're here. And why we're here, I believe, was the consensus of many of us. To come here was not just to have a talk and just spill out. I'm a firm believer in my 50 years that they've never listened to you unless you go for the throat. Okay? And I've always said it jokingly that I'm one of the farm workers in San Quentin would ask me, Al, how do you do it? You know, what you're thinking about, you know, how to do with these big growers? To simplify it, I said, I'm a firm believer that bite the hell out of their leg. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? That means it means the minute they start bleeding, you chase the son of a bitch. Okay? You chase him until he's so tired that he finally rests, but then the infection starts to happen. And once the infection starts to happen, you run him again, the son of a bitch, okay? And the bastard doesn't know what the hell's going on, but the ones that are running, saying, too bad for you, you old bastard, you're gonna fall down, they're gonna get you. I'm being facetious in a way. But the reality is that I don't believe in anything about going to an employer and pleading or going to the, of all things, the Mexican government as labor, or even labor here going to plead, well, let's look at this negotiation and how it's going to be benefit us with something better than nothing. To me, that's bullshit. And what I mean by that is in this movement, there's never been a movement in this country or Mexico, wherever, in South America, wherever, unless the people come under the swell of the rank and file from the streets. And the only way it's going to happen is because of you. That I believe that you're here for a reason. You came because there was an interest. Of what's, what, what's going to happen? Well, what are they talking about? This is the way I feel. And I'm going to tell you that I learned one thing. When we were in the strike in 68, 65 to 68, it didn't look good. Chavez came in. And you'll read this maybe hopefully if I finish my book. He came in and told everybody to show up. 60 people showed up. Strikers and supporters and the kitchen help, everybody there. And everybody said, what the hell is this meeting about? He said, close the doors. Nobody go in, go out. And then he comes down. He said, we're in deep shit trouble. The, the district attorney of this county, that county, this county, is going to file charges against all of us, and we're going to prison. What the shit is this about? And I'm going on a fast. And I am really pissed because his thing was about violence. And the bottom line, he went and he did his thing. Bobby Kennedy came. <coughs> so many months later, they shoot him and they assassinate him. <coughs> Same thing with Martin Luther King. Then comes the whole issue of what are we going to do? We're sitting like this in... Uh, some monastery up in Santa Barbara. And that's when we said, or people said, well, what do we do? And that's what I'm getting to here. What do we do? We we'll walk out of this session here. Uh, we're going to come out with saying, oh, well, we talked about NAFTA, and they're trying to re renegotiate. Uh, I'm for it, I'm against it. But we have to have something concrete, I think. We have to make a 
to say we're going to commit ourselves. And I'll give you the example, the Driscoll boycott. The Driscoll boycott is the best organizing tool, as it was during the great boycott, to go out and build support with unions. Going out into the rank and file, into the factories. No, more, no longer factories in, in, in Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania. What's there now is the Walmarts and the, the fast food industry. They're gone. And the whole question of industrialization is gone. Steel, coal, all these things. So what I'm saying to you is that unless we take this boycott, or any boycott, and we make it happen, because nothing's going to happen with regards to a strike, and then you get a lot of media coverage, and finally, sooner or later, that the strike goes like this, and it's lost, or into the courts. But the boycott is you go after the economics of what the company's concerned about. Do you really think that the Driscoll Corporation likes the fact that my brother Dean here is now wearing the Driscoll boycott uh, t-shirt? No. You go to their website. They're saying... They're kicking the shit out of my, excuse my words, okay? They're kicking the hell out of the, my brand, my label. I paid hundreds and hundreds of millions for that label. And what we're saying is we're going to rub it into the ground until it's shit. Because we're talking about those workers that you saw there. They got nothing. They got nothing. They got homes that are made out of plastic, tin metal, pieces of wood, pieces of pallets. And it's really disgusting for me, after 50 years, nothing's changed, not even in California. I am really upset as a founder of the United Farm Workers Union, and there's not many of us left that can tell the real story of what really happened. There's a lot of romanticism about Cesar Chavez, but let me tell you, he was one son of a bitch to work with, <laughs> okay? And the bottom line is, as much as he was pious and, you know, he looked like a little saint, he was a mean son of a bitch. Okay. Because of the fact is that the whole question of whether we're going to stand up and fight is just what at helm right now. And I'm saying that today I'm really upset. And the workers come to me in the valley, hey, Ralph, what happened? You know, we're having problems in the, in the, in the farms and the ranches. All the way to the San Joaquin Valley. All the way from Marvin, Lamont, Bakersfield, uh, Fresno, Delano, Fresno, all the way to Sacramento, Stockton, even the coastal areas where you have all the vegetable and real crop for strawberries. I said, well, what are you talking about? There's nothing happening. We're, we're left out there. The UFW doesn't come. So lo and behold, on this, the workers you see today, they tell me, help us, please help us. I go, we meet and talk and say, what do you want to do? You know about the boycott. Yeah, I know about the boycott. So anyway, the bottom line is that they decide to call the boycott. Then they tell me the UFW is coming. I'm telling you this because some people don't want to talk about that. I said, what do you mean they're coming? We're not coming, they're here. In San Quintin? What the hell are they doing there when Delano, there hasn't been a goddamn general strike in the last 40 years. In the last 40 years, no organizing. And that's, what are they doing here? We don't know. But they're inviting us because Walmart and Costco and Whole Foods are going to meet with us. We think they're ready to sign. I said, hmm, how long have they been here? One year before we walked out, March 15th of 2015. And you all heard about A&W, Andrew Williams, that company? They're there, based out of San, Jose, San Diego. They poisoned 1,200 people. 200 people went to the hospital. Six people died. They're in San Quintin with Driscoll. So what am I getting at? And I say, well, do you have to help you? <coughs> they say they are. But they didn't. They do not support the boycott. Okay? Because they have an arrangement, an, an agreement with those growers in, uh, in San Quintin. 
What are they doing? They're servicing them. How to take care of their sexual abuse, how to take care of better wages, how to take care of the poisons used in the fields, and, and but, oh, nothing about wages, nothing about union contracts, nothing about recognition, just that we're an NGO now. I guess they're being paid to this NGO for services rendered. Okay? So, I'm saying, what is this? And obviously they're in bed with the Democratic Party. Yeah. And obviously they don't say anything about, you know, the issues affecting our undocumented community. Okay? Tell you what, how far they went. Three, four years ago, they went to Michoacán, a PRI government. And they signed an agreement to import workers, guest workers, into the United States. They import workers when we have a, a tremendous amount of undocumented community, at least in California. Why am I saying that? Because the bottom line is that program that they're involved in, that program is basically an, an accommodation to those corporations of the nine union welfare, uh, Walmart, and they're, they're doing exactly what they want to do with those workers, and they're doing here making it difficult for them to gain union contracts. None of those growers, none of them sat with them in the table to even recognize them and respect them for what they were. It was just, just the uh, Mexican government, the corrupt Mexican government. I'll just leave it there, but I'm telling you that out of this room here, out of this session here, there's got to be something concrete that comes out about going after a real plan or plans of actions. We walk out of here, if we walk out of here with some kind of a plan that tomorrow we can deal with, even deal with it here, then we, we haven't done what we're supposed to have done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excuse me, Steve. There we go. Thank you. Well, I thank you all. Those are excellent, excellent interventions, and I agree 100% with Al that the bottom line is workers have to have self-determination. They have to have their own institution. We have to organize institution among the exploited workers and they voice their own and negotiate their own deals, not some outside entity, not some outside uh, code of conduct uh, from some uh, social public or corporate social responsibility. Those things don't work. And, um, uh, but I wanted to give two quick uh, examples of the issues that we're dealing with, the right to work and um, uh, the issue of, um, uh, of this binational pitting each other against one another. We had that in the 80s when we won that Campbell Soup uh, strike. Campbell's told us in 1989 that if we ask for more higher wages, cause we the first union agreement we have with Campbell Soup, we increased the wages uh, the minimum wage was 335 an hour, it went to 485 in our first collective bargaining agreement. Now this was in 86, uh, so that was a lot of money, jump for the workers. Plus we got a, got Campbell Soup, not the growers who are employed, we got Campbell Soup to pay for, pay for a Blue Cross Blue Shield policy so that our workers could get all the medical treatment, clinic, uh, doctors, hospitals, 100% uh, 100, 100 with the deductible covered by the company. Uh, see, we said, uh, we're not asking for charity. Uh, we're asking for a fair day's pay for a fair day of work. And we don't want handouts. We don't want food stamps. We don't want migrant clinics. All these uh, social programs that were the part of the public policy uh, that with all our liberal friends in Washington, they wanted to... They wanted to uh, institutionalize our poverty by giving these social service programs to keep us at low wages for the industry that we won millions for. We reversed that with Campbell's. Um, but uh, well, they told us that if we asked for more in 1989, that they would just get more pays for Mexico. Now in those days, I had to do some research. Who were the Campbell Soup workers in Sinaloa? Uh, because they had a pace plan in Los Mochis, Sinaloa Pasta. And uh, we researched all of this. I said, well, is, is there a union there? Yeah, one of these sold out unions for the, for the uh, CTM. 
It was called Sintua, um, uh, uh, Sindicato Nacional de Obreros Asalariados del Campo. And uh, I said, well, okay, we're not going to get anywhere with that union before we go to the CTM in Mexico City. So I had the AFL-CIO. We weren't affiliated then. Uh, but after I proved Tom Donahue wrong about the supply chain agreement, he said, well, next time you're in Washington, let me know what we can do for you. So I went and I said, you can set me up a meeting with Fidel Velasquez in Mexico City. So we go talk to this guy, right? And I was criticized by all of my friends in the left, saying, you gonna, you can't work with that sold-out union. They're part of the PRI, and they are, they are, oh, they're going to sell you down the tubes. Is that we need to talk to them. Because, look, we can't demonize the opposition. We have to take them where they are and figure out the next step that we can take to accomplish what we want. We wanted to protect our workers in Ohio. We wanted to increase their wages. But how do we do it when we got this competition with these guys in Sinaloa, which the company's pitting us against each other? So I told Fidel Velasquez, I had to put a selfish twist on what we were asking. He said, what do you want? He said, well, basically, I want your affiliated union in Sinaloa to get higher wages. Because if they get higher wages, I get higher wages in Ohio. He said, well, that's okay. So he invited the union from Sinaloa to come in, and we talked to them, and we put together a campaign in Sinaloa. And, uh, uh, and those were the days when they had some uh, uh, wage uh, ceiling because of the IMF and World Bank loans, uh, there was a limit on wage increases of 10%. Make a long story short, we had a protest in Sinaloa in uh, Los Mochis, and they shut out the, the head of that union, who, who was a state senator, uh, uh, Arredondo was his name, and uh, they shut us out. They locked the plant and wouldn't let us in. And he said, I represent that plant. He said, they shut me out. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of them. Next day, the government called in, intervened. We had negotiations with that union and the company. We won an 18% increase for those workers. And uh, Campbell Soup called me up and said, well, you should have told us you were going to go down there. We would have given you a tour of the plant and blah, blah, blah. And uh, they never once after that mentioned a limit on what we were going to ask for our negotiations in Ohio. So we can win cross-border fights. Because the, the play us off against each other, we have to negotiate, negotiating up instead of negotiating down. The last thing I want to say in the uh, right to work, we've attached, we've attacked this in North Carolina uh, in our contract with uh, with uh, Mon Olive Pickle Company and the North Carolina Grower Association. Uh, when we won that agreement, we got the 78 farms that were contracted to the Mount Olive and the cucumber operation. But those growers were, all, were members of a broader association called the North Carolina Grower Association. So the company brokered that association to negotiate this collective bargaining agreement with us, which we won. But the majority of those workers uh, and growers were not, only 78 of them were cucumber growers, but they were diversified and the main crop that ran was tobacco. So we have to get the tobacco in the discussions in the supply chain. And so um, what we did on the, on the uh, right to work, we have like six of those now 10,000 workers. We have about 7,000 members that are dues paying members, but any, I don't know what percentage of them can come every year because it's on a, they have to clear the visa processing center in, in, uh, in uh, Monterrey. Um, so we may have anywhere from four to 6,000 workers paying a payroll dues deduction. But then the other 3,000 that are covered under the agreement now, it's almost 10,000. Uh, we did a, we negotiated in this last agreement said, look, in the last three years, we've filed process about 800 grievances a year. And if 40% of them are not paying dues, they said, where's the union security in those things? So we negotiated a, now see, the right to work said you got to serve everybody, right? They said, well, we want a compensation for that as part of our security. So how can we do it because of the right to work laws? Well, they were from Mexico. We can cut the deal in Mexico. The American laws don't apply in Mexico. So we use the binational thing against them. And then their policy of saying, well, you got to do it, everybody. So we got a per capita payment for every worker that gets a visa in Monterrey. 
as part of the uh, agency agreement. We call it the labor integrity clause in the collective bargaining agreement. So now we get paid for every work that crosses the border. In effect, we have agency shop in North Carolina. So we can use this whole binational thing to our advantage. Everything they throw against us, figure out a way to use to our favor. I could tell you a dozen stories more about, about that. But look, also I wanted to tell you is that don't worry, there are solutions. It's like the yin yang, for any reaction, there's a reaction. And we have to use it to our advantage. Everything they throw against us, well, what can we do to use it to build our union to get self-determination for the people? Thank you. All right, now I have a sister over here, and I'm just going to let folks know uh, Nativo will be taking over facilitation. We're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'm running out of child care time. So I want to thank everybody for their participation here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I appreciate this discussion a lot. Um, I've been in the labor movement for a long time, but a rank and file union member about five years. Um, and um, when the grocery worker strike happened here in Southern California in 2004, um, I was on the picket lines every day. Rain, sun, after work, on the weekends. And they had community support. Those stores were empty. We could see the meat and the vegetables rotting on the shelves. But when my organization, the Freedom Socialist Party, we went to the grocery workers union and said, hey, call for a general strike. You have support. They refused. I'm sure if the rank and file had been motivated about it and said the community has your back, they would have gone for it. But it's a question of leadership. The leadership wasn't confident for whatever reason. And so that's why they lost the strike. And when contract negotiations have come up since, people get scared. You know, they've lost, they've, they get demoralized. So, you know, I raise it as an example that, one, we have to build rank and file power to confront bureaucratic leaders, you know, to push them to the left or get replaced. As simple as that. Because the leadership of our unions are supposed to do what we want not the other way around. They're supposed to represent our interests. But it's hard work. You have to be willing to fight in the labor movement to get that done. And it's not always easy, but it's worth the fight, I think. Um, I think the other thing that, other examples that have been raised is educating about the power of the strike. Demystify it, don't make it this scary, ugly thing, but it's where our power as workers, that's what we have. Educate about the socialist roots of the labor movement. People forget. I mean, I'm a socialist, and when I say that in my union, it's like, oh, it's scary. And I'm like, I'm not crazy. There's a reason I'm not a Democrat or Republican. <laughs> um, and so I think the other thing is educate about the united front with the community to defend workers and communities across borders. If, if my union, SEIU 721, First of all, divorce the Democratic Party, and instead of taking all that money into electing Democrats that are going to sell us out, put that into actual internal organizing and fighting, not just for good contracts, but the fight against police abuse, the fight to defend immigrants. If it put half of that money into community issues and supported, you know, uh, the boycott of Driscoll's you know, like it'd be a whole different ball game uh, because SEIU 721 represents LA County workers and many others and it's huge. So the potential is there, but we have to be willing to fight about it. And then educate about our labor party. That's anti-capitalist and independent because as we all know, as it's been said over and over, the Dems and the Republicans are not going to defend our interests. And with right to work, we need to hit the streets our homes and workplaces about the dangers of right to work. Confront the Freedom Foundation in Orange County. Whenever they have a meeting or they go to door to door, every union in Southern California should go down there and confront them and tell the truth about what they're trying to do. We have to be willing to fight like hell like they are doing in the Pacific Northwest. You know, they have organized uh, organized workers for labor solidarity across many unions, some that didn't even like each other, but when they know that their livelihoods are on the line, they're getting together to push back. 
that's something that in Southern California we can do. So these are just some things that I've been thinking about. And for the SEIU folks, whether you're in 721 or not, let's talk because I'm looking for other union members in my union to work together and to push because SEIU is an uphill battle, but it's one that needs to be had. Otherwise, if right to work happens, I mean, we can't take a defeatist attitude. You know, I know the sister said in June it's gonna happen. Well, if we fight like hell, maybe we have a chance, but we have to be willing to fight. Otherwise, we're gonna get what we're gonna get. And I certainly, I've, I don't want to have a job without a union. I've worked in the nonprofit private sector. It sucks. Worst wages, horrible bosses that I have no protection. So my livelihood has changed because I'm in the public sector and I have a union. So I know what it means. And so I will fight to defend that with everything I have. But it has to be a, a grassroots effort from the rank and file to push the leadership to do the right thing. Thank you. Who else is up? Anybody else? We're going to be in uh, this session for another 10 minutes. Compañeros, uh, I just wanted to ask if anyone in the un unions um, was um, attacked by COINTELPRO. You all know what COINTELPRO is, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, there's so many people that were attacked in the partido when Ramsey ran that it destroyed our movement. And instead of recognizing that it was the government that was harassing us and making us crazy, in my county, in Dallas County, all the Chicanos, and they only harassed the females. All seven of us were harassed the single females. But I'm sure that, that this happens in the unions. I know it happened to Cesar Chavez for a fact. I know it happened to Cesar. So my, my, my comment is that, you know, instead of kicking yourselves about that you, you're not what you used to be, come to grips that you've been attacked, but you're still around. You know? And that's a great thing. And you still have a lot of power. No mas. Um, what, one of the things uh, that we have to look at is our history. What is the history of the labor movement? We can't look at the future without looking at, at our history. And one of the resolutions that we're going to be introducing today is a call by uh, workers to uh, open the books at the AFL-CIO about the role of the AIFLD, American Institute of Free Labor Development, because this organization was involved, apparently, in working with Ford Motor Company to suppress a strike in the 1980s and 90s in Mexico City. There was an independent union movement there. And uh, so we have to open the books and find out what happened. Did this actually happen? Did the AIFLD, which is funded by the U.S. government, uh, with the support of the AFL-CIO, actually try to suppress a strike? Uh, there's a history to union busting, not just in Mexico, in Japan, around the world. And that is the AFL-CIO has worked with multinationals to set up pro-corporate unions, pro-business unions. George Meany. I mean, they work with the CIA. Why? Because they said the interests of the unions in this country were to set up similar unions, pro-corporate unions around the world. But that hurt American workers. That really hurt American workers. Because when you set up poor corporate unions, you're really cutting your own throat. Because these unions, and unfortunately some of our unions, believe it's better to have profit for the company than to fight for the workers. The head of the UAW spoke to that at a meeting in Berkeley. He said, we're interested about the profit of the companies. Bob King. I mean, when is it that a union official says we're worried about the profit of a company? The job of a union official is supposed to be in favor of the workers. The workers come first, not the profit of a company. He said that at a meeting, a public meeting. So that's the kind of mentality 
uh, that dominates the uh, many unions. You know, the interest of the company is as important or more important than the interest of workers. Uh, the other thing is we are in an ideological struggle. I mean, we want to fight privatization. We want to fight outsourcing. All the unions need to unite in a national political education campaign against privatization. Yeah. This is not one union, it's all unions are faced with outsourcing and privatization. There is no national union organizing political education campaign against privatization. We need it. Why is privatization, even the right to work, it, why isn't there a video in this country about what right to work is? We hear from people about what it is, but there's no videos, there's no propaganda, there's no education material. We need to get education material, and our union should be producing this to explain this to people. The Canadian unions, as a matter of fact, did produce a right to work video because there was a Walmart manager who was running for governor in, in uh, Ontario, and he wanted to put right to work in Ontario. So they went to South Carolina, and they interviewed workers, and they showed what right, right to work was, the reality of it in South Carolina. That's what we have to do. What is the reality of right to work, where they've instituted right to work? It means lower wages, it means union busting, lack of health and safety conditions. That's what it means. The last point about the workers' movement, I mean, the civil rights movement. Yes, the, the, the unions were supporting the civil rights movement, but that wasn't a workers' movement. What does the workers' movement mean? A workers' movement was when the workers actually take independent action. The reason the capitals, General Motors and these other companies, bowed down to labor is because there were general strikes in San Francisco, in Minneapolis. There were occupations of factories. That's when the capitals start to get frightened, when their factories start getting taken over. In Wisconsin, if there had been a general strike and workers had shut down the state and said, fuck you, Scott Walker, we're shutting the state down, that changes the reality. Then the capitalists know, oh, they mean business. And actually, Trump may bring that about because Trump is a confrontational guy and he wants to fight. He wants a war. Well, he wants a war, I say we have to give him a war. And we have to mobilize workers so they express their power. Los Angeles, and I'm gonna bring this up when I speak, we, we need to get all those Driscoll berries out of the, out of the cupboards, out of, out of the stores. If we can, in Los Angeles and Southern California, get the Driscoll berries out of the stores in Los Angeles, that's it. They'll negotiate and they'll, they'll sign the union contract. That's what they understand. We have the power here. There are 800,000 workers in the California Fed. Use that power. There's 700,000 SEIU members in California. You want to talk about a labor party, a workers party? That's the power there. Let's use the power that we have. If we mobilize and use the power we have, we can beat these bosses, we can beat these union busters, and we can build a strong movement, and we have no other choice. Either we fight them and organize the working class, or we will be destroyed. That's what their aim is, to destroy labor. They want a union-free society. They don't want any worker rights. They want us to be slaves. That's really what they want. Oh. State your name, please. Uh, my name is Jeff Freitas. Um, I think that the capitalists are still riding a wave of um, uh, optimism, uh, uh, but American exceptionalism is coming to an end, and I think that even as a labor movement, we can acknowledge that we may not be the, uh, um, the uh, global uh, 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 first. And that uh, as, you know, uh, um, the things that I was inspired by so far at this discussion was the ideas of taking workers south, having worker interactions in a, a new and inspiring ways, um, maybe getting out of our um, uh, sort of stoic uh, necessities of getting the right, politics right, um, but it, seeing that um, people outside of the labor movement um, get glimpses they don't get the whole picture. And so when it comes to making decisions, I think one thing that was helpful about the TPP is I got a lot of information about the TPP from the labor movement. I got um, lists of rules and things that were bad. I got lists of all the unions that were against them. I got lists of the companies that were, you know, in, in sending lawyers in back rooms to, to negotiate this in, in corrupt ways. I got a lot of information that I didn't uh, uh, expect from the labor movement and I think that um, I would like to see more of that um, and I think that the crest of, of optimism on the capitalist part is seeding I think that the um, 
themselves. They understand that they're destroying the planet and Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. Amazon's building biodomes and they understand what they're doing to us. They understand that we're angry. They understand that the youth are um, a un, un, massive support of socialism um, and, you know, and that, um, uh, this, that, that their own uh, uh, you know, leadership of the right at this po point is so sporadic that they can't keep a fix. So I think that we have uh, ample opportunities. I think we have, um, uh, like I said, yin and yangs where we have opportunities. We just have to, have to uh, keep pushing. And thank you. Anybody else? Voy a ser muy rápido. Eh, bueno, soy Emiliano Raya Aguiar, soy eh, estudiante de un doctorado en historia en una universidad, la Universidad Autónoma de Baja California en Tijuana. Y soy estudiante de, un, de doctorado de historia en, una, en la Universidad Autónoma de Baja California en Tijuana. Eh, y soy miembro de, de una organización política llamada el Movimiento de Izquierda Revolucionaria y voy a tratar de concretar la percepción general que tenemos tanto en la organización como en el espacio de Tijuana respecto a esta mesa de trabajo. Y creo que, en primera, creo que dentro del balance general no hay muchas... Eh, eh, no hay eh, problemas de fondo en cuanto a las generalidades. Creo que hay algunos matices que tenemos entre ambos países históricos, culturales, como los que bien señalaba el compañero Villagrán, el licenciado Villagrán. Eh, cierto, por ejemplo, en México el Tratado de Libre Comercio no es la causa de la miseria en México, sino es una de las consecuencias del liberalismo en México. Es una forma en la que se concreta el liberalismo en México y que viene potenciándose desde los 80. Es una forma de concreción. Y después, es eh, cierto, agudiza las condiciones en México. Es también cierto lo que dice la abogada en México no tenemos las mismas condiciones de sindicalización o de participación laboral que se tiene en Estados Unidos. Y entonces tenemos que estructurar una lucha de manera diferente, pero también es cierto que podemos aprender mucho de las luchas en Estados Unidos y que podemos también interactuar y solidarizarnos de las luchas en, con las luchas en Estados Unidos. Pero lo que creo, y es, tomando lo, la palabra que decía el compañero Al Rojas, eh, creo que habría que concretar. Y lo primero es que creo que también las propuestas que se han hecho no son antagónicas y ¿sí? que podemos eh, trabajarlas en conjunto si nos sentamos y decidimos a operarlas. En primera, yo creo que podemos decidir en esta mesa que se apoyará el boicot a Driscoll y se apoyará bajo los términos y condiciones que cada una de las organizaciones y los espacios tenga para apoyarlo. Por ejemplo, en México, impulsar un boicot con los trabajadores o trabajadoras de la maquila es una verdadera mentada de madre porque las trabajadoras y los trabajadores no compran en Costco y no compran en, en Wall porque no les alcanza para comprar fresas o no les alcanza para comprar berries entonces pedirles a ellos que boicoteen algo que todos modos no compran es como pedirle a una gallina que vueles, no lo va a hacer ni aunque quiera, ni aunque pida creo que además hay que eh, Entender que el boicot en México no tiene la misma connotación histórica que tiene Estados Unidos. En México el boicot no se recibe igual, no se entiende, porque el nivel de consumo en México es muy pobre, es magro. Entonces pedirles que boicoteemos cuando de todos modos no podemos boicotear porque no compramos, porque nosotros no somos el mercado de consumo, pues es difícil. Pero sí se le puede explicar al trabajador y a las trabajadoras mexicanas en cómo funciona el boicot en Estados Unidos y por qué es importante denunciar y pedirle a Estados Unidos que se boicotee. Y creo que también es trabajo de los sindicatos y las uniones en Estados Unidos hacer ese trabajo de difusión. La segunda es que creo, como dice el compañero, que si hay que empezar a organizarnos y entonces si no se puede en Estados Unidos, vayamos a Tijuana. Nosotros desde Tijuana les ofrecemos el espacio, pónganle fecha y formemos un comité de organización para la siguiente reunión en la que podamos invitar no nada más más organizaciones de Estados Unidos, más organizaciones de México, sino organizaciones de Sudamérica, de Centroamérica, incluso de Europa, de Asia, de África, que son también espacios en la tierra en los que se sufre de, con la brutalidad del capitalismo. Y el, si ustedes se pueden comprometer a convocar a las que conozcan, nosotros nos comprometemos también a hacer lo propio. Eh, y, y por último, que creo que es la más importante, lo, retomando lo que decía el compañero Steve, creo que el gran problema y la gran discusión es aquí que hay una disputa ideológica a la que no hemos sabido darle el frente y no hemos sabido ponerle cara. Y creo que la propuesta de empezar a convertirnos en periodistas es muy acertada. Nosotros entendemos que lo que hay que construir son grandes espacios en los que medios de comunicación, en los que podamos discutir y podamos evidenciar que existen luchas muy dignas que le ponen cara, que le hacen frente al capitalismo más bestial y al neoliberalismo más brutal, 
pero que también hay forma de solidarizarnos con ellas y de organizarnos con ellas. Creo que es un problema porque el, el gran, eh, uno de los grandes elementos por lo que nos han vencido es que han logrado dividirlos, no nada más físicamente o espacialmente, sino ideológicamente. Los trabajadores en México no se sienten identificados con los trabajadores en Estados Unidos y los trabajadores en Estados Unidos no se sienten identificados con los trabajadores y las trabajadoras en México porque no se sienten trabajadores. Creen que pertenecen a un estrato diferente, creen que por tener un carro diferente, creen que por tener acceso a mejores condiciones no son trabajadores explotados no son trabajadores a los que se les trae plusvalía y eso es falso y los mexicanos no nos sentimos identificados con los centroamericanos los vemos mal, los mexicanos somos extremadamente racistas con las trabajadoras y los trabajadores de Centroamérica, en Sudamérica porque no los vemos como iguales, porque creemos que son diferentes a nosotros y cre creo y creemos en la organización y en Tijuana que el lograr identificarnos como uno solo es lo que nos va a ayudar a lograr ser sensibles con las luchas que podemos entablar y a lograr generar esta empatía de la que tanto se habla ahora pero que poco se aplica y eso pasa por poder construir un medio de comunicación o pues en concreto creo que de aquí podría salir con todos los representantes uno por organización, una por organización, uno, uno por espacio que genere un comité redactor de este, estos periodistas o este medio de comunicación que nos permite empezar a difundir información y a construir una identidad de clase, una identidad de trabajadores y trabajadoras. Sería todo. Nativo, perdona, deja, deja contestarle a Steve, porque creo que parte del problema de movimiento laboral en este país, más de pie, creo que el problema del movimiento laboral en este país ha sido el, el problema central del racismo. Y cuando nosotros como trabajadores, no sindicalistas, trabajadores, no reconocemos el movimiento de derechos civiles como un movimiento de trabajadores, estamos en una posición errona, ¿verdad? El movimiento de derechos civiles no se constituía solamente de gente que quería derechos para ser gobernantes, no solamente derechos para ser este, apropiadores de fábricas, o sea, dueños de compañías, o sea, sentarse en la mesa de directores, sino también poder trabajar de hombro a hombro con trabajadores que tenían trabajos de construcción, que principalmente eran trabajadores blancos. El derecho a poder trabajar en trabajos donde les podía, ellos pudieran tener una, un modo de vivir era parte de ese movimiento. Ahora de que el trabajador blanco no participó en el movimiento de derechos civiles, no hace el, el, derecho, el movimiento de derechos civiles que no sea un, tra, un movimiento de trabajadores. O sea que es, no es un, era un movimiento de trabajadores de, de la clase trabajadora. Por eso ese problema sigue existiendo. Ahora en Norte Cora, donde yo estuve, los compañeros de los sindicatos de, de laboradores se opusieron a que los compañeros indígenas pararan las pipas de aceite que están contaminando las aguas sagradas de los compañeros indígenas ahí en Norte Cora, principalmente de los compañeros Lakota. Y creo que ese es un problema que tenemos mucho, muy este, central en el movimiento laboral. No estamos combatiendo el racismo que existe dentro del movimiento laboral. Tenemos muy, mucha gente con buen corazón, tenemos mucha gente que está dispuesta a luchar, pero sí verdaderamente tenemos que ver ese problema porque es un problema que nos impide seguir adelante. Si miramos toda la dirección, en mucha, la mayor parte de los sindicatos son compañeros blancos, la dirección. A pesar de que muchos se quieren salir, porque ya estamos veteranos, ¿verdad? La dirección dice, no sabes qué, aguántate unos seis años más mientras agarramos a alguien más. Y se quedan ahí, ahí llegan este, arrastrando el cuerpo a los sindicatos, pero ahí siguen. Pero ese es un, es un dilema que, se, que tenemos que este, combatir. Y yo, mira, no quiero este, debatir esta situación porque es una parte pe pequeña de, todo el, de toda la lucha. Pero sí es una parte significativa. So we're going to conclude this session and go back to the plenary, but I, I do want to remind you um, who here remembers 
what was the slogan that was used in a fight of workers in the very state where Martin Luther King was assassinated. Does anybody remember that? I am a man. I am a man. And it was the trash haulers strike and fight that were predominantly African American. And so the observation that, that has been made here, pro and con, it's a little bit more complex than, than just saying that the civil rights movement was not a, a workers movement because the civil rights movement truly was an independent movement. And what was the social composition of that movement if not workers? That's not to say that the pastors that could be categorized as middle class or petty bourgeois or, or whatever were not at the, at the lead, principal lead of that movement, but that movement was a national movement, okay? And there were workers in participating in the leadership of that movement throughout the country. It wasn't specifically, classically defined as a workers' movement, but anybody that looks at that movement and says that the composition was not working class didn't know what the civil rights movement was all about. And the demands of the civil rights movement actually advanced the rights of all workers, not just African Americans. I, I particularly uh, part, par, partake, partook in the, what was called at that time, the Chicano movement. I know that uh, Juan Jose, the same, say, the same with him. Valdemar, the same. We all came from working class families that were fighting working class issues that appeared in the form of civil rights and it had that edge of civil rights but the space that was created in that movement further advanced uh, our rights as a people uh, of the working class of the United States, a multinational working class of the country participating with other workers and uh, I take exception to uh, the statement that was made that all white workers were opposed to the civil rights movement. We know that's not true. The civil rights movement would not have been successful if not a sector and a large sector of the white working class, perhaps not the organized sector, but certainly many of the working, I remember UAW. Meany was probably in a different space, but UAW, the brothers, were walked in those marches with Martin Luther King. The same thing in, in, in the Chicano uh, movement. So it's a little bit more complex than that. And, and the reason I raise that is because there's different social movements today that are of a working class social content, but perhaps they appear in a different form. LGBT, the women's movement, and I can go down the line, right? But in their social class composition, they're workers and they're broadening spaces for all workers of all colors, of all nationalities, of all languages. And so it's our challenge to see how we link those up and that the workers that express their movement in an LGBT character develop class consciousness so that they understand that yes, we're fighting for the rights as LGBT, but as workers of a working class, that's a social class opposed to the ruling class of capital in this country. So I'll just conclude with that. And uh, that was like my two cents uh, on the matter, but we're gonna reconvene in a plenary and hear from other speakers that have joined us this afternoon. Thank you. Same thing, sisters, we're wrapping it up. Same standard for everybody. Okay.